Hi guys, Mr. Kennedy again. Um, we're going to finish up our lecture on chapter one, introducing you to environmental science by just dealing with our ecological or our environmental footprint and um, kind of like the differing worldviews that are out there with regard to how we utilize our resources um, as a human population. So one of the things that um, you were asked to do in your summer um, assignment was to go through and um, evaluate your ecological footprint. And the ecological footprint is really just uh, a measurement of how many or how much of our resources do you use. And at the end of the day, um, hopefully you were able to learn a little bit about uh, your impact on the environment and how important it is to use the resources that uh, you have access to in a sustainable way. Um, if you measured your ecological footprint and found that it took like three planets to sustain you or four planets to s sustain the way that you live, um, hopefully you realize that that's a measurement just to sustain you. And if everybody in the world lived that way, obviously we would run out of planets if there were seven billion people who all needed three planets to survive on, right? Um, so how do we kind of get an impression or uh, idea for what our environmental footprint is doing to the environment. Well, the easiest thing to talk about when we think about that is pollution. Um, pollution comes in a lot of different forms. We've got a pollution chapter later in the year. I'm just going to throw this out here for you uh, to consider at this point. Um, so there's various kinds of pollution. There's persistent, um, you know, pollutants that don't break down. Um, there's degradable or non-persistent pollutants that do break down, um, or non-degradable pollutants that can never be broken down that you see on this particular slide. Um, just to kind of give you some perspective of where these things end up, they'll end up in your air, your water, and your soil. Um, if anything is in your air, your water, or soil distributed there by man that threatens food, threatens our health, um, or the health of other living things, we just give it a blanket term of pollution. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm not going to tell you that, you know, you can't have, you know, a, a lifestyle that is comfortable for you. What I can tell you is, is that if that lifestyle puts things into the air, the water, or the soil that threaten the life or survival of other organisms, that's where the problem lies. And we need to look for alternative solutions uh, so that you can still have that comfortable lifestyle, but not contribute these things to the environment uh, that could threaten other, other living things. Um, there are a couple of other things to consider in terms of pollution. There's point source pollution and non-point source pollution. In terms of point source pollution, this is pollution that's pretty easy to track down and identify. Um, and we can take action immediately to try to clean it up. Non-point source pollution is much more difficult to deal with. Um, it's much more difficult to track down and much more difficult for us to handle on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, point source pollution, we can go to a business owner a factory and just say hey you know what you know these smokestacks you got to clean this up non-point supports uh non-point source pollution like we don't even know where to start we just know that there's pollution in the water and then we have to try to backtrack it and find it okay um something for you to think about like here's a picture of acid mine drainage right um is this a sustainable way of living um is this point source or non-point source pollution and um at the end of the day you know, what can we do about it, okay? Now, as dreary as all this sounds, I do have to offer you some signs of hope. And uh, those signs of hope come in the phrase, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, that's a phrase that you've probably heard a lot in uh, the past few weeks, months, or even years of your life. It is something that's becoming a standard that we see uh, put out even on television, reminding people to recycle. Um, if we can reduce what we use, if we can reuse the things that we are using again and give them new life, if we can take things that we've used and recycle it, all of that's going to increase the sustainability of human populations and reduce our impact. There's tons of other signs of hope in the environment. Um, population and pollution, I'll just kind of let you read through this. Many cities are more livable today than they were a century ago. Um, birth rates have stabilized, clean technology is being used more and more. Um, health, the incidence of life-threatening disease has been reduced in most countries. We have an expanding knowledge base of, of just how to live sustainably. Um, 
We have sustainable resource use and habitat conservation on a level that has never before uh, been accomplished in, in a global scale. We're shifting to renewable energy sources, even here in places like the, you know, Fresno County. We've got solar panels going up on houses. We've got solar panels that are being put out in fields. Um, carbon markets and standards on how much carbon dioxide are put up by a business into the atmosphere are in place. And we're even seeing international cooperation. These are all great things, but there's still a lot to be accomplished and a lot of ground to cover. And uh, the real reason behind it is because really there are some differing worldviews on how we interact with our environment. There are a massive number of people out there that are still human-centered. Planetary management is kind of like their focus. Um, humans are number one. All we need to worry about is the here and now. There will always be more in the future. You know, plants and animals reproduce so we can use what we want. Um, natural resources are here for our benefit. Okay. Um, on the flip side, we're starting to see a, a growing movement of earth-centered people, earth wisdom, as it's called. Nature's not here just for us. There is not always more. Sustainable growth is kind of, you know, the direction we need to head to learn to cooperate with nature and uh, with each other. Okay. Um, so these two competing worldviews are just two perspectives that are out there. Uh, when you think about these perspectives, we also have to kind of consider the ethical viewpoints of how we deal with the environment. Ethics, when you think about ethics, it's just the concept of right versus wrong and what you've learned in your life and how you've been raised might, you know, affect your ethical perspective. So there's three basic perspectives that are out there. Anthropocentrism, biocentrism, and ecocentrism, which are defined for you here. Um, anthropocentrism basically says, hey, only humans have rights, Right. So whatever we're going to do, right, really just has to benefit people. Costs, benefits are measured only on their impact on people. Um, biocentrism says certain living things also have value. But really the certain living things is usually a function of what people need. So like a cow is worth more than, I don't know, a burrowing owl or something like that because people eat cows, right? Um, ecocentrism says that the whole ecological system has value. Um, so you, how you're raised in your ethical perspective, you know, you might fit into one of these categories or you might move between these categories throughout your life or maybe by the end of this class, your view might change. OK, um, there are a couple of other ethics that I want to share with you from chapter one, the preservation ethic. Um, the preservation ethic is the mindset that was pushed by President Roosevelt. Um, he, he believed that um, basically nature should be protected for its own inherent value, right? We need to protect the environment in its pristine state uh, to promote human happiness and the fulfillment of life, right? He and John Muir um, both had this, you know, ecocentric viewpoint and they wanted to preserve nature as is, and Roosevelt's given credit um, as, as a result for establishing a lot of natural, um, uh, a lot of uh, parks and uh, natural history reserves and things of that sort. The conservation ethic um, says, hey, we're going to use our natural resources wisely for the greatest good for the most people. Okay, that sounds almost oxymoronic, but that's Gifford Pinchot. Um, who had an anthropocentric viewpoint. Uh, Pinchot basically said, you know, like, hey, look, it, it's all about people. So a utilitarian standard that calls for prudent, efficient, and sustainable resource extraction to serve the needs of people, and that's what that conservation ethic is all about. Um, and then the last one is what's called um, a land ethic. And um, basically this ethic says we need a healthy ecological system um, dependent upon protecting all parts, and this was pushed and promoted by Aldo Leopold, believe that humans should view themselves and land as members of the same community. And so we were obligated to treat the land ethically, right? Um, or to basically care for the land as we would care for people. The land ethic, you know, um, was used to kind of just guide his decision making process, okay? Um, so there are a lot of different ethical perspectives out there, and uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you which one is right 
right? I'm just telling you these are the different viewpoints. And because there are different viewpoints that are out there, um, you've got a lot of competing arguments and a lot of voices that want to be heard, okay? Um, there are a couple of other things that um, we want to finish with with regard to chapter one before we shift gears into the scientific method. And um, those ideas are centered around environmental justice, okay? And the concept of environmental justice basically just it gives us the idea that the poor and minorities are exposed to more pollution, more hazards, and more environmental degradation than any other population on a global standpoint, right? And that's where this idea of, um, you know, toxic colonialism comes from, right? No one wants the next garbage dump in their backyard, okay? When Fresno's dump is full, where are we going to build the next one? Do you want it behind your house? I know I don't. Right. So what is often done is um, we look for um, a poor community that basically can't fight expansion and can't defend themselves um, from these sorts of things. And or maybe are even tricked into thinking this will be a good thing, because if we put the dump here, then it's going to uh, somehow bring jobs or make your life better. Um, and it expands not just to small communities here, let's say in the United States, but even globally. The U.S. exports more waste um, than any other country, and we take things like e-waste and we ship it overseas because we don't want to bury it in our own landfills, right? Um, so these are things that um, create serious problems for us. In the end, we need to figure out to a way to live sustainably for all people, um, to use our planet and its resources in a way that sustains humans and other organisms for the future leaving our descendants with a rich, full world, developing solutions that work in long term, um, you know, and require the idea of keeping fully functional ecological systems for you to enjoy life, for your children to enjoy life, for your children's children to enjoy life, right? Um, you know, will we develop a sustainable, you know, way of life? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I think this is the single most important question we face. Um, in closing on chapter one on these ideas, I just want you to think about this. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's just not. All right. I will see you in the next installment. We'll learn a little bit about the scientific method there. Um, have a great day.